Okay, so let's uh, get started. Uh, hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. So welcome to today's SNAP seminar by Professor Vivek Borkar from uh, India, from IIT Bombay. Uh, uh, Vivek obtained his uh, bachelor's from IIT Bombay, master's, uh, and, uh, master's from Case Western Reserve University and PhD from University of California, Berkeley. And he has held positions at uh, TAFR, Indian Institute of Science and IIT Bombay in India. Uh, and he's currently at IIT Bombay as uh, SS Bhatnagar Emeritus Fellow. He's a fellow of IEEE, AMS, as well as uh, National Science and Engineering Academies in India. His research interests are in stochastic optimization and control theory with uh, algorithms and applications, particularly to communications and machine learning. Uh, today, he's going to talk to us about uh, dynamic choice with uh, reinforcement under graphical constraints. Um, quick instructions before we get started. So if you have any quick questions, feel free to post them on chat. And we'll have a couple of breaks uh, in between the talk. Professor Borker will stop a couple of times to take any questions. If there are any urgent clarification questions, I'll keep monitoring the chat box and uh, ask them uh, and ask them, yeah. So without further ado, Professor Borker, the floor is yours. Thank you, Shiva, for the invitation. So I don't have too many slides, so I guess there will be enough time to stop and answer questions. So this joint work with uh, Kavachenkov, who is in the audience, Sheryu Muharir, my colleague here, and Suhail Mohamed Shah, the former student of a postdoc in Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Okay, so this is a list of mostly of what I'm not going to do. So this is this. Um, work is actually a jumble of several things, but I want to pedal one particular idea, which is uh, what I call an yield landscape which I feel can be used elsewhere. In particular, I'll skip the, the some part of the analysis, which is reasonably routine, so I'll just skip that. And uh, uh, the other extreme, I'll also skip the more messy and technical mathematical details. Uh, I, I won't skip them entirely, but I will send you some kind of verbal description of the ideas involved. And I'm also the numerical experiments. So let me start with the model. So the model is quite simple. You have a sequence of agents arriving one at a time, and they can choose from finitely many options. So each time the agent just arrived, picks one of them, and gets a noisy reward. The identity of the agents is irrelevant. I mean, it doesn't play any role. So generality, you might as well assume that it's a new agent arriving in it. And the choice probability is, so we choose one of the objects with some probability and uh, those probabilities are uh, proportional to a function of the total reward accrued by people who chose the same item in the past. So I'll make this uh, more precise later. And uh, the way the F is designed, that this reflects uh, some known phenomena such as and these are different terminologies from uh, domain. Increasing returns is from economics. Positive reinforcement is what we are used to. Herding behavior in social sciences and so on. That's the rough idea. So they're not kind of the usual. I mean, uh, there's some similarity to bandit problems, but uh, there are many differences. Uh, I'll mention more of, about that later. Now the function F will be chosen in particular to be positively homogeneous so that you get the probabilities by normalizing it. So it's independent of the scale because of the homogeneity. In addition, there's an extra parameter alpha, positive parameter. And it, it is such that if you let alpha increase, then the probability, or rather let alpha go to infinity, then the probabilities will concentrate more and more on the most rewarding options. Okay, and for fixed alpha, uh, there are two, two kind of results. One, the initial work is for fixed alpha, so you get a with probability one convergence to one of the many possible equilibria, which can, and it's a random limit, for, uh, a random limit which can, of course, depends on particular sample path. So, this is uh, what one might call the curse of non, non linearity. So it's called the trapping phenomenon in uh, 
the lit literature on increasing returns economics which was pioneered by Brian Arthur and Paul David. So the idea is that there are multiple equilibria possible and you can get trapped in one of them, which I mean, they may not be all equivalent in terms of uh, uh, what you gain, what the rewards gain from them. Some may be better than the other, but uh, you can't choose. With some probability, you uh, may get uh, into a suboptimal equilibrium. And Arthur has uh, some popular articles, which are some interesting examples of those, including adoption of suboptimal technologies in history. Uh, he talks about this, um, the, how VHS won over Sony Betamax for video recording. And uh, there's some more exotic examples, such as uh, counterclockwise clocks. He, one of his articles is a photograph of some old Italian church where the clock goes counterclockwise. So apparently they could go either way, but eventually people got used to clocks going clockwise and that's where we are now. So there are both a mix of interesting social or otherwise phenomena and a genuine engineering problems where you run into this. So the idea here is that uh, this parameter alpha with uh, called inverse temperature by analogy with simulated and really As, uh, you don't keep it constant, but it slowly increase it to plus infinity. And one can give a kind of a anthropomorphic uh, interpretation that the agents are slowly gaining confidence in their collective judgment themselves and their peers and start uh, making the choices with greater and greater confidence. Okay. So this is what I call anneal landscape. So uh, this is distinct from classical simulated annealing, though I have borrowed the terminology. So here, see, in classical simulated annealing, you are uh, basically slowly decreasing the variance of noise in this, uh, if you think of the real valued case. Markovich, yeah, I guess it, it's the same interpretation in the discrete case also. So you are slowly decreasing noise. And uh, here you are, uh, you are not doing that. You are actually distorting the objective function slowly. And uh, of course, uh, I should add that we do add noise and let it go to zero slowly, but that's for a different reason. It has a more tame objective. Uh, I'll come to that later. It's not same as simulated. And this uh, la last thing is a kind of a, sorry. It's an intuitive, uh, just take this with a, a pinch of salt in the sense it's more an intuitive claim. I don't have any precise mathematical statement to back it, that this works better because um, it's from the, it's basically a stochastic approximation. And therefore uh, it works on the time scale of stochastic approximations, which is, which is much faster, but it's uh, faster than the time scale of uh, classical simulator. Okay. So we have a few examples in the article, but I uh, picked only two of them. So one is customers who arrive on, suppose I want to buy a book on Amazon. So I, of course, get this rating from one to five stars, plus I see how many people have bought it. Okay, so both, both things matter. So if just one guy gives a five stars, it carries very little weight. So you think of the overall rating as a product of the rate, uh, rating times the number of reviews. So that can, uh, that's a kind of surrogate for the total reward uh, or whatever the utility for people who bought it till that point. So that's the kind of thing we have in mind. So if it's very high, I will take to buy that. Book. Now, similarly, if you can think of an autonomous agent, a UAV or a robot scanning some area, so of course it can go from, okay, sorry, I forgot to mention one thing in the first example. So that, that's the reward part, but the, there's something additional. In fact, the, perhaps the most interesting aspect of our work is the graphical constraints. You cannot jump from one choice to any other choice. There's some restriction uh, in terms of a graph. So in this case, it would be you probably look at the recommendations of the people who bought this book also bought uh, a few other books and you, you might buy one of the listed ones. So that's the way you, you can think of constraints. And this can be also true in other web-based activities such as you watch a YouTube video, then 
you get a list of videos uh, based on what you have, your watching history plus the uh, number of people who have watched it. And generally, you don't move down the list beyond maybe the first four or five. So that also serves as a question if you are just searching for interesting a music video or something. The second example is if you're an autonomous agent, a robot, or a UAV scanning an area. So it naturally has a constraint. It can move from, suppose you can think of kind of grid, uh, grid world, I mean, you spread the space into discrete uh, squares or whatever. So you can move from one spot to only one of the neighbors. Okay, And that may be dictated by whatever the performance measures you are looking for, the radiation leak or uh, any incident. If it's a disaster scenario, it could be something like a radiation leak or other ways. Okay, so I have listed only two fireworks. This, as I said, there are significant differences from bandit literature, but all said and done, it is inspired by bandit literature. And in particular, uh, the, the first paper by Viraksha Jose Blanchett and uh, Ramesh Johari was what, what started on this. So, and that, uh, what they do is they have some kind of separate exploration phase where they are something very clever with it. They have something called balance exploration in the for a certain time till you have explored enough uh, and evenly, not only enough, but evenly across all the bandits. And then they stop and use whatever they have done. And then they get uh, various uh, bounds and so on, or concentration bounds. And, uh, the second one is actually the, there are some similarities in terms of technique also, but their objective is completely different. They actually go for a multi-agent game problem and look for epsilon Nash equilibrium. Okay, so let me start on the main main work. So, so again, as I said, uh, there's a stream of agents arriving one at a time and choosing one of them distinct objects holistically. Now, the cyan is a basically indicator that i object is picked at time n. So cyan is one if n th agent picks object i. S sub i of n is the sum of indicators psi k equal to i. Uh, cyan is not the indicator. Cyan is equal to i if n th agent picks object i. S i n is the sum of indicators uh, of psi k equal to i for k sum over k from zero to n. So it's the number of agents who pick i till time n. And SIN is the SIN by n, so it's a fraction of agents who pick I till time n. Okay, then uh, so simple algebraic manipulation of relation gives you that uh, SIN plus one equal to SIN, so one by n plus one times indicator psi of n plus one equal to I minus SIN. So people who have, look, who have worked in earn models are used to this. This is how you often start. So I have fixed the initial condition kind of arbitrarily as uh, uniform, just to sort of not put a bias in any particular. You know. it, that's not very important. So Xn is an iteration. It's a stochastic approximation algorithm. So slightly more general than Robinson's rule. I'll come to that later. And it takes evolves in the, the simplex of probability vectors uh, in m dimensions. So vectors x as a sum of xi is one, and xi are non-negative. So it's a probability vector valued recursion. So now the graphical constraints. So I assume there's a graph in the background with the node set uh, script V and S script E. And the nodes correspond to basically these items. So the cardinality of E them. Script and I denotes the neighbors of I. So set of J says so vertex is J or nodes J says so that I G is an H. And I assume that I is an NI. So there's a self loop, which means that you can continue with the same choice for a while if you choose so. And also if you can choose J after I, you can also choose I after G. So there's some symmetry. Okay. And let Fn be the sigma field of everything. Uh, basically, psi k, uh, k less than equal to N. So all the history real time N. And then I assume that the choice probability, that the probability that you choose J at time N plus one given the past is one minus epsilon N times this P sub alpha sub sine J xn plus epsilon n times chi sub j of psi n. Okay, so, so this is where, uh, as I said earlier, that although we don't do simulated anything, we have a decreasing noise. So epsilon n is going to zero. And chi is the uniform distribution on the neighbors, uh, set of neighbors. So with some small probability, you pick one of the neighbors 
with equal probability and with most probability you use this uh, transition kernel which i'm about to specify okay so this as i, as I said earlier this chi uh, j is is a uh, uh, this epsilon n times chi j is a slowly decreasing exploration noise but uh, it has a different purpose than simulated annealing and epsilon n can uh, decrease faster than what we would do in simulated annealing. T alpha i j uh, basically it moves over neighbors, so this is an indicator j, that j is in in the set of neighbors, and then you choose uh, go uh, j according to probability proportional to f sub j alpha of x, where f sub j alpha is given by mu j x j alpha, and this is chosen in particular as it has to be positively homogeneous and, and it indeed is so that it's independent of scale once in a while. And the, here, of course, you might wonder that you, you know Muj, there's nothing left. But uh, this is the I am going to look at asymptotic behavior where this is fine. I don't uh, do regret analysis or whatever. So here, the full model actually we start with. So this is one of the details I'm skipping, skipping basically altogether. So full model works with noisy rewards, and uh, so it's some f, f alpha j x is replaced by f hat alpha n sub i of x. Which is given by this object mu hat i n x i n whole thing raised to alpha, where mu hat i n is a consistent estimate of mu. Okay. So this part is uh, so passage from this to what I have put in the first line, first display is relatively easy. So I'm not going to worry about it, given that I'm going to look at n tending to infinity. Yeah, so that's what I say here. Finally, that I'm going to work with f alpha j and not f hat alpha from i n. Now, if I fix, so this, this, uh, this yeah. argument x, okay, yeah. Okay, so there's an argument x, it depends on x. Eventually, it will be replaced by xn, but let, suppose I freeze x and put epsilon in, in equal to zero identically, then that uh, uniform sampling drops out and you just have the p, p alpha sub ij. And then that's actually a reversible with transition probability and you can check just by checking local balance that the stationary distribution will be given by pi tilde alpha of pi of this quantity. Okay. So this plays at this object, the right hand side plays an important role in this. So it's the local reward plus uh, uh, basically the local reward times the neighbor neighbors rewards of the wrong neighbors normalized. So now the plan is to now I go into my usual Teaching mode, I am a teacher for stochastic approximation theory. So I am going to use the stochastic approximation view of this iteration, and in particular, the technique known as ODE approach, which has historically developed over several works. It in fact began in the Soviet Union. Semyon Mirkov was now in Michigan, then Derevsky and Padakov, they have a joint paper a little later, and then Leonard Lum, who developed it further. It's all mid to uh, roughly mid mid seventies. So the um, original Robbins Monroe paper is nineteen fifty one, and uh, soon after there was a lot of activity, but this came uh, around twenty five years later. So I'll just change the ODE approach for those who haven't seen it. Those who have seen it might uh, get bored, but uh, that I have to risk. So I have taken a somewhat general formulation. So Zn plus one is Zn plus n times h of Zn comma yn plus in plus mn plus one. This is a general form. So the classical Robbins model doesn't have this yn, and this, this is iota n actually, and, and nor does it have iota n. It just have h of Zn plus mn plus one. Okay. So this yn, iota n, and mn plus one are three kinds of noises which I have included. And script fn is again the history of all this. Everything that has happened till time in the sigma field generated by everything. Now, there's this uh, this is the masterpiece of Robbins and Monroe, this f size or what ML people call running parameter. It satisfies the Robbins Monroe conditions. So, it because of the second condition, it goes to zero, but it goes to zero slowly enough that it sums up to infinity. And the, why it should be so becomes clear if once you know the ODE approach. Now, out of the three kind of noises, the first one is. Mn is a martingale difference noise, so it uh, expected value Mn plus one given Fn is zero. It's uncorrelated with everything that happened till time n. Okay. 
So this is the simplest. Iota n is actually even simpler. Some bounded random variables which go to zero. Okay. Typically, some kind of numerical error or round of error or something like that. So if you sort of if you make better and better measurements or approximations, it goes to zero. And yn is the Markov noise. This is the harder part generally. X value is in finite state space. So it's like a Markov chain, but kind of a modulated Markov chain. So probability that y plus y given fifty to time n so is e sub x n of j given y. So if that sub x n was not there, it would just be a Markov chain. In fact, in many applications like uh, some of the reinforcement learning algorithms, like TD Lambda, it is a Markov chain. We fix the policy, but uh, uh, very often it's uh, the transition probability depends on x n, which is which is changing slower than y. So I'll make this precise, but that's the important thing to do. So it kind of uh, I call it modulated transition probability, and I assume that if I fix x, then this transition probability is uh, Irreducible with a unique stationary distribution phi sub x. So because it depends on x, the stationary distribution will also depend on x. Okay, then this is the this is note that uh, uh, the algorithm will track almost surely the differential equation z dot t equal to sum over j pi z t j of x z t j. So what happens is that uh, iota drops out because it's vanishing anyway. The material difference noise is conditionally is conditional means are zero, and using appropriate Martingale theorems, you can show that it averages out to zero. So in the limit, it tracks the ODE where the Markov noise uh, effect remains, and it gets averaged out and is replaced by the corresponding stationary distribution indexed by the iterate itself. So this ZT is basically the limiting differential equation for the iterates. So this it also come, appears again as the script of the stationary distribution. So this is the fact I need. So a quick run through the how why this works. So n is going to zero as I said. So the discretization errors are asymptotically negligible. Sum of n square is finite, and this plus sum. So because mn plus one, mn is a Martingale difference sequence. This object sum m plus zero to n, a m times m m plus one is a Martingale. So under some Technical technical conditions which I did not mention and n square less than zero, sorry less than n, some of n square less than infinity. So this object converges with probability one, and that means that if you look at the, it's a convergent series, so the tail of this series goes to zero. So the noise ad added from n onwards goes to zero. So what that means is that error due to noise is asymptotically negligible if you consider the iterate from time n onwards. Okay. So the both the discretization and noise errors are asymptotically negligible, and uh, and as I said, n goes to, because the algorithm is moving on a slower time scale because n is going to zero, n is like a time step. So the whereas the Markov chain is on a faster time scale, it's from the natural clock one two three four. So the drift gets averaged with respect to the stationary distribution, and that's how you get the OD limit. And finally, this this is important. You are tracking the ODE, but you want to capture the asymptotic behavior of the ODE. So you have to track the ODE for the entire time axis, and that's ensured by this fact that the sum of n is infinity. Otherwise, you will just simulate the ODE approximately on a finite time horizon and not get much. So the proof uses so you just linearly interpolate the iterates. So I define this z bar as a piecewise linear continuous function. So first, you define this a time uh, time instance t zero is zero and t one is a one t two is a one plus a two sorry t t one is a zero t two is a zero plus a one and you keep defining the time instance and define z bar at t n at z n okay that's the iterate and then just interpolate linearly that's it and then you take this moving window t to t plus capital T so you remember that uh, it's not hard to see that. Uh, the error, if you compare the interpolated iterates with OD starting at the same initial conditions, the errors will accumulate over time. You cannot just do the time from zero to infinity for comparison. What you do is use a moving window t to t plus capital T, and everything I said earlier that the errors going to zero due to discretization, noise, whatever, go to zero asymptotically with probability one that works. So basically, Martingale noise gets averaged out and simply goes to zero, disappears. Markov noise leads to the averaging with the stationary distribution, and uh, you get what I said. Now, the limiting behavior will be interested in convergent. 
convergent aspect of it, but uh, a general characterization is given by Michel Benheim in late 90s, and it shows that convergence of the dynamics in general is to something called internally chain transitive invariant states of the differential equation. This is some notion from dynamical systems theory due to Conley. And it kind of gives you a starting point in case things are complicated. For example, game theoretic learning models, uh, things get complicated very quickly unless you are a, you have a potential game or zero sum. Okay, so the other thing I need is uh, two time scale stochastic approximation, which is uh, where we, here is x and comma y, except that I'm using two different time scales here. Same as uh, Robin van der Rijnsen's on both, but it's additional assumption that bn by n goes to zero. Okay. So bn is uh, going to zero fast, faster. So this is a slow time scale. Yn is moving on a slow time scale. So when you look at xn, you can think of yn as quasi static, it's hardly moving. So you can analyze xn by pretending yn is frozen. So I fix yn at y and look at this ODE, x dot t is h x t y. Suppose, okay, I have not included Markov noise here, but that's okay. I mean, same thing works for Markov noise also. Suppose this has a globally asymptotically stable equilibrium lambda of y, which is Lipschitz. The Lipschitz, et cetera, is here for the well positiveness of the differential equation. Then what do you expect that xn will track lambda y, and which is actually true. What you can show is xn minus lambda y and goes to zero with probability y, which means gn, xn comma y n, uh, is uh, nearly, I mean, gn xn comma y n minus g of lambda y n comma y n goes to zero almost surely. So the ODE you get for y dot t doesn't have x in, in it. Okay, so suppose this ODE, y dot t, g of lambda y t, comma y t goes to some y star, the next n y n go to lambda y star and y star, comma y star. So this is the kind of em emulates nested do loop. So you can think of uh, uh, nested iterations and x in the faster time scale is uh, traditionally the inner, inner loop and the slower is the outer loop. So uh, typically you would wait for the inner loop to nearly converge before doing a single iteration for the outer. But this allows you to iterate both of them at the same time, but with the different times, uh, on different time scales so that you get the same thing. So probably this is a good place to stop for a few questions. I have a clarification question. So yeah. earlier, uh, when you presented the model, you said how uh, if if epsilon was zero and yeah. for a given x, this is stationary distribution, and you showed the stationary distribution. Yeah, yeah. But in reality, x is changing, right? So are you going to use the two time scale approach to kind of? That's why I introduced it. Oh, okay, got it. Got it. So, but uh, again, going back to your problem, if you, what happens if you actually don't have uh, uh, the alpha, if you, if you pick alpha equal to zero, uh, what happens? I presume you don't learn. Yeah, uh, that also will become clear actually. Oh, okay. okay, okay. <laughs> Part of the next half. Okay. In fact, the last slide, not last, but almost there's a figure which kind of clarifies it then. So I'll wait till then. Okay. Okay. Okay, then maybe I'll continue. That look like there are any other questions. So I return to the model and I define this phi sub i of alpha of x as this is the numerator of the transition probability I defined, defined divided by x xi. Then the ODE turns out to be this. Okay. Okay, so incidentally, that ODE I had put epsilon equal to epsilon equal, sorry, for the that expression of stationary distribution, whatever it is. Yeah, here I'd put epsilon at zero, but now actually epsilon is going to zero. So I'm going to look at the limiting ODE and therefore I have happily put it zero. So I'm not bothered about that. So I just take, so this is what it looked like. So uh, just by dividing this, so this was the numerator there. I have divided this by xi, I call that phi sub i alpha of x. And then I can write the limiting ODE will be actually the station corresponding stationary distribution. The same object which I had before, but just because of this trick, I've been able to write it like this. Okay, there's a special reason for this, which is that appears in the next okay? So the limiting body after just a minor manipulation. So since okay, let me backtrack a bit. I had the indicator function there, which was function of a slowly changing Markov chain. Okay, so in the original iterate, x n plus one is x n plus one by n plus one times indicator of sin plus equal to j minus x n. Okay, minus x n. 
so that um, uh, the ODE analysis will average that indicator with respect to stationary distribution. So you just get the stationary distribution here minus xit. So you will get pi sub i of xt minus xit. Okay. So I just written that pi sub i of t, except that I have juggled around a bit by introducing this new thing and just rearrange that uh, just small manipulation. This is so just a same ODE as what I had displayed for the general Markov noise case. And the reason I did this is this, that this is a time scaled version of the replicator dynamics. If you just multiply through by the denominator here, it will start looking like this. Okay. So some uh, some proof involved, but uh, it works. And it's a time scaled version in the same that uh, sense that uh, xt will be z of tau t and z t will be x of tau inverse t, where tau t is some function which in, goes to infinity. That's important. So they, they both cover the entire positive time axis. Okay, so I, I'll use this connection for one particular reason. I mean, this simplifies life a little bit. So the origin, actual limiting differential equation is this, the equation one. Okay, so in case uh, perhaps you should mention what replicator dynamics is. So this is kind of standard here for game theories. So this is something which comes from mathematical biology or rather evolution, uh, evolutionary models. So then the idea is so this is a again this is a differential equation in the probability simplex. So z i t are non negative and sum to one. In fact, if you sum the right hand side, it's zero. So z i zero sum to one, it z i t will sum to one probability. And t i t has the so z t is the kind of z i t is a fraction of population of species i. Pi i alpha z t is the payoff to population i when the current population is z t. Okay, so this tells you the evolution of i species. So pi i alpha z t is the payoff to that species minus this is the population average. Okay, so z j t is the population uh, fraction of species j. So the this summation on the right hand side is simply the average payoff of the population. So if you are doing better than the population, your share increases. So the fraction of i i species increases and otherwise it decreases. So this is an interesting phenomenon. It doesn't necessarily converge. The biologists worry about whether you see all the faces that j i equal to zero for one or more i, they are invariant and correspond to extinction. So their traditional concern has been whether it goes extinct or not. So we are looking at algorithms. So we are happy if it converges somewhere. So the focus tends to be different, but it's been extensively analyzed. So one famous book by Hopper and Zygmunt, which deals entirely with this. And more recently, in a more economics or game theory framework, the book by William Sandholm also has a fair amount of details about this. Okay, so this is a replicated dynamics and it corresponds to a potential game. So you say that it corresponds to a potential game when P, this payoff, P alpha I of ZT is the i partial derivative of some common object, Psi alpha. Okay, and that happens to be the case if I take Psi, it's actually minus of this. So psi, psi alpha, if I take to this, then that phi alpha j is del by del xj of minus del by del xj of psi alpha. So it's a potential game. Well, okay, so this aij is the adjacency matrix of the graph. And potential games, you already know what happens. If they converge to the local minima of the potential, where it, because of minus sign, it will go to a local maxima of the potential function. Okay, so we're already halfway through the convergence result for fixed alpha, or almost there. I just did this extra condition, which is kind of a, okay, I'll say about it more. So let me just read it out. I assume that the equilibrium points, namely the local maxima of this, one can show that actually they will be in the interior. Uh, that's a sip, uh, that I won't touch now, so in small detail. But they are, I'll assume that they are isolated and hyperbolic. And also the stable and unstable manifolds, if they intersect, they intersect transversely. So this is not something I divide. This is a special case of what's known as a Morse mail system, except that the original definition allows also for limit cycles. So this just makes life easy. It's, in particular, it's a kind of a what they call structurally stable situation. If you quarter up the model a little bit, it won't change much. So they're hyperbolic in the sense that the, if you linearize the right-hand side of the differential equation around that equilibrium, 
then the Jacobian has eigen, does not have eigenvalues on the imaginary axis. They're either on the, uh, the real value is either strictly positive or strictly negative. So if you cut off that model a little bit, if something was on the imaginary axis, it could have swerved to the right or left. So they're, they're already on the right or on the left, not on the boundary. So if you perturbate a little, this remain on the right or left, whatever they want. So this is one aspect of structural stability. The other is that the stable or unstable manifolds are not tangential. I mean, they don't uh, touch tangentially, they are transversal. So if you perturbate a little, they remain transversal. So this is something from dynamical system theory, which uh, saves uh, a lot of trouble. In them. Of course, there are the more general theories, but uh, we haven't uh, braved that side of it. Okay, so the each local maximum is a stable equilibrium. And uh, one can show that uh, extent converges to possibly random local maximum with probability one. And the probability of convergence to any one of them is strictly positive. So there are two, uh, two, two statements here. One is that I'm claiming that things which are not, okay, sorry, that, that comes a little later. Okay, so it will go to one of, one of the local maxima with probability one. I'm not saying it goes to global maximum. But what I am indeed saying is that it does not go to any other critical point. Namely, it does not go to a local minimum or a saddle point, a point of infection or whatever. Okay, that's a non-trivial statement. And this is where the epsilon in going, the epsilon in going to zero plays a role. So this is the part I will mention towards the end. Okay, so, and this is also where, see, so what if the uh, diminishing noise is doing for us to avoiding undesired, I mean, they're avoiding things which are not local maximum. This is different from de what decreasing noise does for simulated learning, where it avoids undesired local maxima as, uh, as well. It, you are looking for global maximum. Okay, here you don't avoid global ma local maxima. We are avoiding local minima and other such undesired objects, but not local maxima, which are not local maxima. So there's a less ambitious objective for the diminishing noise and therefore the conditions required are different. Now the local maxima are the form uh, of the form pi i equal to z i raised to one by alpha, where z is the local maximum of this quadratic form. This just change of variable, this is nothing. Okay, so it, uh, I, I changed, of, uh, changed variable so from x raised to alpha to SI raised to alpha to GI, so that gives me this. Okay, and then the, of course, the set over which you are, uh, sorry, the domain changes to this particular object. So Y non negative, except that it's not some Y equal to one, but some Y raised to one by alpha. And I'll soon show a figure what, what this means. But before that, I'll just define, so this is my definition of B raised to alpha. And uh, B infinity is just uh, this kind of thing, is just uh, this, basically with the, intersection over alpha blah, blah, positive blah, blah. And B star is basically, B star are tips of all the coordinate vectors. And that's the subset of this. That's, that's the subset of uh, B infinity. So this figure is a better way of explaining. So if I start with alpha equal to 0 0.5, I get this, uh, this usual Euclidean ball. Alpha equal to one will lead to L1 ball, then alpha equal to two, four, etc. You see that it shrinks to B infinity, which is basically a, 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 a union of these, uh, uh, basically, these arrows, okay, the line segments joining the origin to one of the one zero zero one or whatever. Okay, B infinity is just those tips. Sorry, B infinity is this set, and B star is just those tips. It's just the tips of the unit vectors or unit coordinate vectors. So our objective is to converge to the best of the unit uh, tips of the unit coordinate vectors. Remember that. So I define B to be the set uh, of the, uh, the basically I which have the best reward. This capital Pi alpha is the set of probability vectors which the local maximum local maximum of psi alpha. And uh, key, one of the key results is that alpha and, as alpha and goes to infinity. And if you consider so, this need not be a singleton. So if you consider it in this. Okay, then uh, in fact, I think I should, uh, yeah, this probably, I should have taken a close convex all of this. Yeah, that's what the proof needs. 
then pi n will converge to V star. So that's where, that's the main result. Oh, sorry, that's half of the main result. And that uh, leads to this, so uh, alpha n goes to infinity and epsilon goes to zero slowly compared to the mean iteration. Then this, this, this recalls that this is a quality vector. So this is a mass it assigns to the best candidates, the best uh, objects, objects of the maximum reward that go to one with probability one. So it concentrates on the best item with probability one. So in the remaining time, I, hope, I think I should be able to make it and give an idea of the proof. The purpose of epsilon of going to zero is to avoid uns unstable equilibria, which is the uh, equilibria of, sorry, equilibria other than the local maxima. So yeah, remember, so local maxima are the only stable equilibria. I, okay, I forgot to mention that the fact that any stable equilibrium for stochastic approximation has a strictly positive probability is an old result which uh, came out of Brian Arthur's work on increasing return. This is their papers by Kermoliev uh, and uh, Arthur and uh, Kanyoski uh, and Arthur and so on, where they showed uh, that uh, under mild conditions, if the noise is rich, rich enough, you cannot avoid any stable equilibrium. There's always, basically there's a positive probability of hitting the domain of attraction of any stable equilibrium. And then once you are there, uh, there's of course a pull towards that equilibrium. So with a positive probability, you go, go there. You cannot avoid stable equilibria a priori in stochastic approximation without this deep, like uh, adding small noise. So that, that's taken care of. And then epsilon goes to zero, uh, helps you avoid everything other than local maximum. So those are also, also not a priori ruled out without some technicalities, but that, that's okay. I mean, that, that, that's less demanding, technically. Now I'm going to use two range scale argument as uh, Shiva had guessed. So for fixed inverse temperature, the differential equation uh, is, I called it a nonlinear polymer of probability equation. All I mean is that it's a ordinary differential equation taking values in the probability simplex, which is nonlinear. Okay. So people are, uh, I think everybody has seen this in mean field limits, but this is a different, different variant, I mean, different version of a different kind of nonlinear polymer application. This is actually the ODE limit of uh, the empirical measure for vertex reinforced random walk. So this was uh, yeah, originally introduced by Robin P. Manton, and uh, I think it was a part of his thesis and studied not by using ODE method, but later on uh, he had left one conjecture which uh, Michel Benign analyzed using uh, using the ODE method, because of course he's a stochastic approximation person. So in fact, he an, uh, did a general a general analysis, kind of broad analysis of the nonlinear scheme, and then he specializes to linear reinforcement mechanisms and does a lot more. So what we do is somewhere in between. We have a nonlinear scheme, but a specific nonlinear scheme, not a general nonlinear scheme. And uh, uh, our, uh, okay, so, for this, uh, the Kolmogorov equation, you end up getting uh, the nonlinear version of pi equal to pi p, the fact that pi is invariant under p. And it's a fixed point equation because p of all also depends on pi. So it's pi equal to pi times p of pi. Well, it's a fixed point equation. That's exactly what we have. And then again, the, uh, by replicator dynamics, we know that it will go to a uh, local maxima. And then from stochastic approximation theory, we know that almost cover convergence to sample part dependent local maximum. But because alpha is changing on a slower time scale, uh, that's not enough because in the uh, two time scales result I quoted, which is the vanilla result, I had assumed that there's a unique globally asymptotic equilibrium, which is not the case here. <laughs> so there can be multiple possible limits. I have to look at the close connects all of them in fact. And uh, then look at uh, then look at the Update, update equation of alpha, which is trivial, more or less, it's just a deterministic update. It's a deterministic uh, iteration on a slower time scale. But you can, using two time scale logic, you can treat it as a quasi static and analyze the original dynamics and then use the two time scale algorithm. But now you have to the OD track the close convex hull of the stable equilibria. It's not a single point. So the vanilla thing, vanilla two time scale analysis does not work. And that would have been a major problem because this is not at all easy. 
because what you have is the, not a differential equation, but a differential inclusion. Instead of x dot equal to h of, h of xt, your x dot t belongs to some f of xt where f is the state valued map. Okay, so that's called the differential inclusion. This was also, there's a big push for that by, because it appears in game theory and so on quite a bit, game theoretic learning. Uh, there are the two major works by, again, Benign, uh, Hofwar, and Soran. And a lot of uh, subsequent work was done by one of my former students and student Shalab Bhatnagar and his students. So I feel that uh, it's uh, after a long academic career, uh, one of the high points is when you start learning from your own students and their students. This is one such instance. So they, Luckily, uh, fairly recently, I mean, we were just in time, they had done all the extremely messy work to extend the two time scale arguments to differential inclusions, and all we had was to invoke it and plug it in. So that takes care of what's left. So now, now the main thing the avoidance of perhaps result. So, okay, so this is the terminology ran after that popularized. So the avoidance of uh, local maxima, which are which you consider such facts in the kind of like getting trapped in some undesired convention or undesired technology. So economic economists do uh, consider these as facts, of course, of which facts. And uh, I, ha I have an earlier work for the Robinson Monroe kind of scenario to to avoidance of traps under suitable conditions. So I basically adapted that. Yeah, so the, here the intuition is that the noise pushes away the iterates from the undesirable states often enough so that by the conditional borel cantilly lemma, they move away with probability one. And here I think the figure is, uh, speaks better than the words. So this is a hyperbolic equilibrium. So this, this intersection is a hyperbolic equilibrium. So if you linearize the Jacobian of the right hand side, it's, uh, it has both positive and uh, eigenvalues in both positive and negative half, uh, half spaces of the complex plane. So the ones in the negative half space correspond to stable direction. So this is a stable manifold. Okay, so if you start on the stable manifold, you converge to that point. If you start on the unstable manifold corresponding to a positive, uh, positive real part of the eigenvalue, uh, unstable eigenvalue, it will move away. Okay, so you know what happens on the stable and unstable manifold. You converge towards it if you are unstable, converge away if you are unstable. But what happens if you are elsewhere? If you're elsewhere, you, you start close to a stable manifold, you come near but move away. So unless you are exactly on the stable manifold, you move away. Okay, that's the main thing. So generically, so for almost all the, the topological sense, or if the noise is uh, Lebesgue continuous in the Lebesgue sense, for almost all initial conditions, the OD will move away from the equilibrium. So what you need is the, the noise should kick you away from stable equilibrium often enough. Okay, so what you do is look at this kind of some small set, some truncated cone, and ensure that the noise conditions are such that if you start converging towards a stable con equilibrium, you get pushed away often enough. And then you use the conditional borel cantilly lemma, which says that if roughly if <laughs> probability of a given b n is say bounded away from zero, that's the simplest statement. And if BN happens infinitely often, almost surely, then AN will also happen, happen infinitely often, almost surely, but that kind of argument. So I have a few more concluding remarks and I'm um, about done. So you can give a concrete example. So the, the paper has that, sorry. Where the unit dynamics gives to is basically uh, uh, analog of a potential whale. So two potential whales, so two uh, sort of highly clustered subgraph connected by just a, by a single link. So if you keep fixed alpha, you will have uh, asymptotically some probability on one of the two. But if you let alpha go to infinity uh, slowly, it go to the better one. Okay, it's very easy to uh, construct example. So, okay, additional results we have is that the fully connected case, case that is the, if the graph is complete, there's, a, there's no graph constraint. You can say a little more of some explicit, uh, explicit kind of computation. It kind of, uh, some of it uh, for fixed alpha resembles anti-colony optimization. So there you have a sort of reinforcement mechanism where you are not guaranteed a term pro uh, probability one convergence to optima. <laughs> but what it has is that the reinforcement mechanism in the anti-colony optimization builds up a bias towards the optimum because the ants prefer the 
um, parts with higher pheromones with the preceding the previous ants have deposited. So slowly preference for a, for the better tra tracks builds up and then it's kind of not always, but at least for the simpler cases, it converges to the optimum with high probability. It's a probabilistic statement, not you start seeing that kind of a phenomenon here. So we also have numerical experiments and then future works, of course, we have been we limited ourselves to what people kind of cynically call an asymptopia. That was hard enough, but it will be good if one can get some finite time bounds and so on. And uh, something I told you that uh, to take that my statement about comparison, comparison with theoretical com uh, comparison with simulated annealing with a pinch of salt. It would be interesting. I, I, just, I, I, I feel interested in uh, having a serious analytic comparison with simulated annealing. One thing I forgot to add here is comparison with bandit literature because our, our take is somewhat different from people working on bandits uh, view the problems. And, and it's certainly, see, this is, a, this, is a, this is a more complicated scenario. This is a non-trivial dependence and so on. So the, one can show uh, in the kind of, it, it will do better than the naive bandit schemes, but uh, I'm sure you can, there are a lot of clever minds working on the bandit schemes. So I'm sure uh, that parallel is worth pursuing. With that, I thank and uh, thank, thank you for your patience. And uh, the title is already on the archive. So uh, let's all thank Professor Borka. So we have some time for questions. Feel free to unmute yourself uh, and ask any questions. Maybe I'll start with one. Um, I'm a little confused about uh, the main result. So the main result says that with probability one, uh, you're converging to the best arms, the best choices, right? Yeah, the yeah the relative frequency. So X is the remember the X is the relative frequency, the chazar of correct. Because the empirical major concentrates on the best with probability. On the best. So you're not getting stuck in the local optimum. So if alpha was fixed you would get stuck in local optimum, but by changing alpha, you're actually- No, no, sorry. Yeah, no, no. Even, see, we are, all the time we're looking at convergence of X. So, mm. sorry, we made, made that clear. It's always the empirical major converging, converging to something. So, Chedaro sums, it's always Chedaro sums. Okay, okay. Uh, no, I mean, I was confused about, so you said how you could get stuck in local maxima, but then the main result is actually not doing that, right? It's actually going to the yeah, right yeah, arms. So yeah, really, yes, for exactly. fixed alpha. It's Costa. For six alpha, alpha, you can get stuck in local maximum. It's okay. also it's also interesting to consider the unconstrained case. So in the unconstrained case, it really depends if alpha is smaller than one and uh, or alpha is greater than one. Uh, so, yeah. So if alpha is smaller than one, then system is uh, um, behaves much better. Mm. Okay. Okay. Got it. Got it. Thanks. Yeah, alpha less than one, in fact, you get a concave maximization problem. So it's much better. I forgot to put that. Oh, I see. Okay. And you mentioned about two time scale, right? So one time scale corresponds to epsilon, the other time scale corresponds to alpha. No, no, epsilon actually it, it is not does correspond to time other time scale. Epsilon is that that iota n, you know, that asymptotically vanishing error. Oh. That's kind of Viewed by the time scale analysis itself, so it, it's subsumed in that. The slow time scale is one alpha over alpha uh, recursively. So why, what we, we define this so-called temperature one by alpha, and just decrease T n plus one is T n minus B n okay. times. Basically, it's a slow decrease of the T n, a slow see. increase of alpha. I see. Okay, got it. Got it. Thanks. Any other questions? I have a question about the graph itself. Like, uh, what exactly is it modeling? Uh, I didn't quite get the nature of the connections. Can you no, the, the, so, uh, the, the thing is, once you choose some item, I'm assuming that whatever you choose after that is constrained. So, 
so the best example is probably this um, uh, robot searching so you can go only to a neighboring location that's one possibility and more generally in this web based things you suppose you just follow the recommendations mm. can, can, I, can i can i also give a try is question again yeah. so so you know <clears throat> to to me a very nice fitting example is an, an example of youtube uh, mariana i guess you used youtube right uh, I don't, but my kids do. Yes. <laughs> yes, at least from time to time. So, so, no, she does. She watches snap seminars on YouTube. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> oh, your, oh, your kids. I'm sure your kids. But my kids are experts. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they know everything about YouTube. <laughs> yes. So, so uh, if you recall, in YouTube, you have a list of suggested videos, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you watch one video, okay. and then you get a list of suggested videos, right? right? So, and actually, if you pay attention, most of the time you get fairly uh, highly ranked suggested videos yes. or suggested videos with many views, right? Right. So, so it means that here we have example of positive externality. So the more video uh, is ranked, the more video is viewed, the more likely it will be suggested, right? right. In the future. So, so the, 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 this is, uh, can be modeled but by this function f, the I, utility yeah. function. So, so uh, the, the more video has views, the more likely uh, a new customer will choose this video. So th this is about the probability of transition to a new item. And how about constraints? So the constraints here come from the size of your screen, right? So on your screen, just physically, you cannot fit more than say uh, say 10, 10 suggested items, right? And okay. you know, there's a, a quite a nice statement that well, what is the best way to bury information uh, on the web is to place it on the second page of the Google, right? So no, nobody, nobody goes beyond the first page of suggested items. So very, very seldom, right? So, right? so you can say that in this case, the, the, the constraint is 10 closest items, the 10 most, run, most highly ranked items. Uh, th does this help, the, my example? Yeah, it helps a lot with the motivation. What, what I was a bit confused about was the type of the edges that you're considering in the model, right? Uh, you're saying if I is in, in the set of neighbors of it, so- Yes, if, so here a set of neighbors are say, uh, semantically similar videos. So consider all semantically similar videos, but we even restricted further by the size of the screen. Okay, that, okay, That's, thanks. Yeah, in fact, that, actually, that I guess, sense. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, non-symmetric would be an interesting thing to try, but uh, our proof uses reversibility. That expression for stationary distribution came out of uh, reversibility, so mm -hmm. without uh, without that, it's probably a much harder. Uh, I think similar results should be possible. But, uh, yes, I, I also agree. Yes, similar point, but uh, it will be much harder because we don't have explicit expression in, indeed. Uh, I see. And with reference to Kostya's example, the, the also that I think he had pointed out a book to me, which I have yet to read. So there's, uh, this question also uh, lead to uh, bubbles in this YouTube. Yes, social bubbles, yeah. social segregation. So, 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 so yeah. we can say that our scheme somehow proposes to break social segregation. <laughs> well, maybe it's too ambitious, but uh, <laughs> why not? Why not? To <laughs> thanks. Cool. Okay, let's uh, thank uh, Professor Borker again. Well, thanks for the invitation. Mm -hmm. See you again next week in Snaps. Thanks. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you.